Hey everybody, Charles Ford, HumbleMechanic.com. Today, I'm gonna to be taking your questions on dual mass flywheels, DSG services, my worst jobs, and more. This is episode 135 of the Humble Mechanic Podcast. All right, in order to get a question on a show like this, email me, Charles, at HumbleMechanic.com, and be sure to put question for Charles in the subject. That is what I use to filter out questions for these shows. I've also been doing some quick videos that are just one question unedited, straight from my iPhone. So check that out in the quick videos playlist. I'll be sure to link that up. Also, a couple of other things. Wookiees in the Woods is coming up very soon if you are a Golf R owner or an R32 owner. There's a really cool driving event in the mountains of North Carolina. Check them out. I'll put a link down in the video notes to Wookiees in the Woods. As well as Treffen South dates have been announced. It is the Sunday before Labor Day. So be sure to check that out. It is the event at Atlanta Motor Speedway. I was there last year. Awesome, awesome event. I'll be sure to link that up too. All right, before I get to your questions, let's talk about the sponsor of the day, which is CRP Automotive. CRP deals on a ton of OE maintenance and repair parts, timing belt kits, suspension components, AC parts, even fluids. In fact, they make the factory DSG fluid for Volkswagen and Audi DSG transmissions. So check them out at crpautomotive.com. All right, now that we got that taken care of, let's get into your questions. First one comes from Dave. My question is for a DSG transmission. I've seen your video with Paul where you change the DSG oil and use gravity method. I know that you use a pump method at the shop, but I'm not going to buy a pump just to change the fluid every 90,000 kilometers. That is probably a smart move, Dave. I noticed that you just filled the DSG with five liters of oil, then disconnected the fill tube and put the plug in. Every other video I've seen says to plug in VAGCOM, work through the gears, don't connect, disconnect the oil unit until it's at 35 degrees Celsius. Will I damage anything if I follow your lead on this? I don't want to have to purchase a $350 tool for the sake of changing DSG fluid. Also, the question of buying such a tool, is this something that would be a good investment? I know I would only use it when I have a light on. Where's the best place to purchase one? Also, I'm looking at purchasing a 2009 A3. I'm a little concerned of all the info that I've been reading about oil consumption. Is there any way of knowing the engine does indeed have consumption problems before I purchase it? All right, so awesome group of questions. Let's actually start with the scan tool question first. Do I think it's worth spending $350 on a scan tool like VADCOM? I absolutely do. It is an incredible tool. Three check engine light diagnosis concerns and you've basically paid for the tool. In addition, you're gonna have the tool to do this job by the book, do the DSG service by the book. So do I think it's worth it? Yes. Do I think that there's some good ones out there that are less than 350? Yes. If I was gonna buy something, I would go ahead and get the VADCOM. It's what it's for. They are an incredible company. It's an incredible product. I use it at the dealership. I use it and anytime I'm doing anything offsite, VADCOM's my go-to. I've been using it for a really long time, you know, somewhere in the neighborhood of eight years or something like that. I highly recommend it. So you should buy that, and yes, you should technically buy the book, hook your VADCOM up, and bring the transmission temperature up to 35 degrees. Let anything that's gonna drain out, drain out. You'll get a tiny little dribble out and jam the plug back in. I can tell you that that does not happen every time on every DSG service across the country, across the world. Here's why. Customer comes in and says, hey, I'd like my DSG transmission service, and the shop does it. Well, the customer drove the car there, right? They, they're gonna hang out, they're gonna wait. The shop's not gonna let the car sit around all day while the transmission cools down. Some ways around that are we put the fluid in the freezer and let it cool down. That helps, but it doesn't always get you where you wanna be. If you put five liters of transmission fluid in that transmission, by the time you get the tool out, put the drain plug back in, you're gonna lose some fluid, which gets it really darn close to the exact amount of fluid that you need in the transmission. Here's the thing about transmissions, especially Volkswagen and Audi transmissions. The fill and fluid level check methods are completely subjective. So what I assume to be as a trickle of fluid could be something completely different from what you assume a trickle of fluid means. And we're talking not even cups worth of difference in fluid. So the way I've generally done it is I pump the five liters in, I pull the machine out, 
I then grab the plug and I put the plug in and I lose a bit of fluid and that gets it really, really, really close to the exact amount of fluid that the car needs. Again, perfect world. You would get VAGCOM or a scan tool, you'd get it from zero or whatever you know ambient temperature is up to 35 degrees Celsius, drain the fluid out till you get a tiny stream of fluid at 35 degrees Celsius, put the plug back in and you're good to go. Are you gonna damage anything by slightly overfilling or underfilling these transmissions? When it comes to slightly, you're not gonna damage anything. If we're half a cup over or under, it's not gonna damage anything. If we're three liters under or over, now we got a problem. Now we're gonna be dealing with issues, but a little bit over, a little bit under is not gonna be a problem. As far as your A3 oil consumption concerns, the only way to be 100% sure is to do an oil consumption test. That involves like 500 miles of driving. It involves a weighed amount into the engine on an oil change and a weighed amount out on a, a drain for about 10 minutes. So that's the only way to be 100% sure. The advice that I always give to everyone is bring the car. In this case, I'd bring it to the dealership and have them check it over. Ask them to check the history of the vehicle. They can pull all the warranty repairs that have ever been done on this car and let you know, hey, this has already been re-ringed or something like that. Also, from what I understand on the Audi side, it's not so much the A3s that have the issues, it's actually the A4s, the longitudinal engines that are more of a concern than the other ones. So I'm sure the A3s can have their issues too, but I don't think the A3 was nearly the issue the A4 was. But again, get it checked out, get the history, the warranty history, the maintenance history, any information that you can about the car. Because at that mileage anyway, you may have oil consumption concerns, but there's a whole lot of other things that I would be concerned about buying a car with you know 70,000 miles on it or uh, you know 94,000 kilometers on it. There's other things that I would wanna check too, not just oil consumption. All right, next one comes from Kevin. Hey dude, I got a 2004 TDI, has a wicked vibration when you're under load. Honestly, I'm thinking dual mass flywheel or axles. Wanna give me a little insight? No real abnormal noises from the bell housing area. Wanting some insight on diagnosis of this. All right, Kevin, it is 100% impossible, man, for me to diagnose your noise based on two sentences on the internet, but I'm gonna do my best to try and help you out. So we have a vibration on acceleration. We can eliminate a few things. I really don't think it's gonna be the dual mass flywheel. It can be. What I don't know, is this a DSG transmission? Is this a manual transmission? Maybe we have some clutch slipping, causing a vibration. Uh, an axle can absolutely cause a vibration. It can also cause a vibration on D-cell as well. We also can have something as simple as a bent wheel uh, causing a vibration. Generally, bent wheels aren't only on acceleration. That's usually on a cruising speed. So you know, maybe we can't eliminate that, I don't know. What you're gonna need to do is get the car up in the air and start with some visual inspections. Look at the wheels and make sure that they're not bent. What we're gonna need to do is get the car up in the air and do some inspections. Look at the wheels and make sure that the wheels aren't bent. You know, rotating them around, it's really easy to see if you got a bend significant enough to cause a good vibration on the car. Uh, take the axle, move it up and down, move the axle in and out and see if there's any significant play. Check the wheel bearings, you know, grab the tire, go side to side, top to bottom, something like this. My guess is that it's probably gonna be an axle issue. Um, man, you know, it could be a dual mass flywheel, but for the most part, those make a ton of racket before they cause any kind of vibration. So it may be worth getting the belly pan off, sticking your head you know, underneath the car with it up in the air and giving it a listen while you're having someone drive it and accelerate it. Be very careful, don't just do that on jack stands. You want like a legit lift, uh, maybe even worth taking it somewhere and having them put it up in the air and, and letting you listen. So it's a tough, tough, tough thing to diagnose noises period uh, and vibrations period but doing it you know, based on a few sentences, it's really tough, man. Get the car up in the air, do a good visual, check for any loose components, and really start there. All right, next one comes from Brandon. I've been having some starting issues. The engine will sometimes start, but isn't consistent or reliable. It has a better success rate when it's cold and barely ever starts when it's up to temp. I've checked and also swapped batteries to a known good one that is the same spec as what's needed. I've also changed to a Duralast AutoZone starter and still have this issue. Any help would be extremely helpful for me. Love the videos and keep up the good work, Brandon. 
All right, Brandon, awesome question. So we have an issue where the car's not starting properly. It seems to be more when it's hot than cold. Start off with checking our connections and our wiring. We wanna check our battery connections. You said you swapped it, but we not only wanna check the terminals on the battery, we wanna check like the chassis ground. We wanna check the power connection. Most of the time there's wire straight from the battery to the starter, but that's not the only one. We also have a signal wire to the starter. We wanna make sure we take a really good look at that. Check our fuse panel, make sure we're not getting some other issue causing it not to start, whether it's crank or actually start. You're gonna need to do some diagnosis, man. A good multimeter is gonna be your friend. Um, also, you know what really works well with this kind of thing is having a second person go in the car, try and crank it, and I don't know, whack on the starter with a, an extension and see if that jumps it and makes the car start. There's also a few other things that we wanna look at. If your car's a manual, maybe we have an issue with the clutch switch. You know, it, it really depends, but start off by looking for loose connections, poor connections, loose wires. If you have a manual transmission, let's make sure it's not the clutch switch. We can jump the clutch switch pretty easily on most vehicles. I don't think you told me what kind of car you had, so uh, you can jump the clutch switch really easy and make sure that's not the issue. I have had mixed results with non-factory starters. Sometimes they're good right out of the box and fine. I've had a lot of non-factory starters that are bad right out of the box. And you know, talk about something that's enough to drive you crazy. You diagnose a no start concern, think it's a starter, and you put a new starter in and the car still won't start. And it turns out to be the other starter. So that's one to drive enough to drive you nuts. Um, I mentioned the signal wire for the starter. You wanna make sure you're getting power there because if you're not getting power there, now we work backwards. You know, is it an ignition switch problem? Is it a relay problem? Is it a convenience module issue? You know, uh, on the Passats, a lot of times the like the B5.5 Passats, the cars wouldn't start because the convenience module is underwater. So there's a lot of things that can cause that. Start simple, start under the hood, and work your way from there. All right, next one comes from Josh. What's the most nightmare job you have ever had to do? Um, this is an awesome question. You know, most jobs really, they end up being nuts and bolts, and sometimes they suck. Sometimes they're not nearly as bad as you thought. I remember not too long ago doing an AC compressor on a direct injection Torag. Uh, that wasn't a whole lot of fun. But, you know, again, it's not terrible, it's just nuts and bolts. I feel like the worst job I've ever done wasn't really like one job, it was just one car. And it was a 2004 Silver Phaeton. This Phaeton came back probably 20 times for AC leaks, the refrigerant and the air conditioning. The guy's air conditioning would just stop working. We'd charge it up, we'd leak test it, it would pass. We would drive the car, it would be fine. The customer would take it two days later, bring it back in with you know 100 grams of refrigerant in it. We replaced every part. I mean, every part of the AC system, seals multiple times, uh, everything. You know, we, we strategically secured the caps for the refrigerant to make sure that the customer wasn't you know pulling the cap off and letting refrigerant out because he wasn't happy. So that eliminated that. Finally, the car, I think we traded him out of it and sent it somewhere else because we never really did find the source of the leak. I mean, there was no dye anywhere. All the parts had been replaced. It was just a nightmare of a vehicle. Uh, I've talked about another Torag before where I went round and round and round for like a week and a half. Uh, not straight every day, but you know, each day I worked on it, but I would take breaks to work on other cars. It ended up having a driver's seat module that failed and uh, sometimes would bring the CAN bus system down, sometimes it wouldn't. You could drive the car around with the alarm going off. It was, it was a nightmare. So I guess Torag and Phaeton would probably be up there. I've done a few body harnesses in my career. Those aren't a ton of fun, especially doing them under warranty because you're never gonna make the time on them. Other than that, you know, most jobs, I may not love doing it, but it's generally, especially once you're done, is really not all that bad. All right, got time for one more. This one comes from Thomas. My 2012 GTI has 140,000 miles on it. For the past four years, it's been an absolute joy to drive. Other than some water pump issues, it has run great. Now, besides routine maintenance in the owner's manual, is there anything you would recommend servicing or replacing on a 2.0 TSI manual transmission with that many miles on the odometer? Can you give me a list, starting with the most highly recommended first I'd really appreciate it. All right, Thomas, 
Get your pen and paper, my man, because we're gonna go down the list. Let's start off. Number one, the most important, absolute most important one is gonna be to get that timing chain tensioner checked and or replaced. I did a video on exactly how to check it. I'll link it up. Uh, but uh, on a 12, your odds of having the early variant tensioner are really good. That is going to be the most important one, period. Okay, get that one checked. From there, we wanna check for oil leaks because oil leaks can actually lead to other issues. You mentioned water pump failures. That a lot of times is caused by not only poor workmanship on the install, especially on multiple pumps, but oil leaks. Oil will leak down from you know the cam bridge, It'll leak down onto the water pump and cause an oil leak. Uh, not a bad idea to make sure your brake fluid has been replaced. That's in the owner's book, but make sure that gets done. It's really not a bad idea to do a transmission service either. You know, the manual gearbox oil is really good quality oil. It is lifetime, but at 140K for, I don't know, 100 bucks or whatever it costs to change that fluid, I think it would be well worth it. Another thing that would probably make your GTI feel like it's new again is a suspension refresh. Check the bushings, make sure your control arm bushings aren't coming apart. Maybe shocks and struts would really make that car feel like it was brand new again. But Thomas, the great thing, man, the great thing is you got a great platform car. If you've made it to 140K and haven't had a bunch of issues, odds are you're probably not going to. You know, from doing those basic things that I just mentioned, from there on out, you're only replacing parts as failure parts like wheel bearings and axle boots and things like that. You know, Thomas, the great thing other than the things that I mentioned is most everything else is going to give you some kind of warning before like catastrophic failure. Things like a check engine light will pop on. You know, I, I just said check engine light. Probably worth mentioning a decarb. Cleaning the intake valves would really do the car well. But even then, most of the time you're going to get a check engine light for cold start misfires. Do the normal maintenance, man. You've done a great job at 140, like I said, if you haven't had too many catastrophic, or really any catastrophic failures. So keep doing what you're doing. Get the timing chain tensioner checked. That is at the top of the list. Number one, most important thing you can do. Other than that, man, rock and roll. Keep loving your GTI. All right, guys, I'm gonna wrap it up there. If you have any questions or comments, post it in the comment section below. Hey, if you like the video, throw it a thumbs up on YouTube. I always appreciate that. You can also subscribe on YouTube or on the blog at HumbleMechanic.com. You can follow me on Facebook, Twitter, Instagram, the blog, and obviously right here on YouTube. All right, guys, thanks for watching, and I will see you next time. Drink of the day was simply a glass of water.